All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the call, everyone. Good to see you. Um, so we have quite a few updates um, in our guidance document. So uh, we're gonna start off by walking you through that, but the majority of this time will be um, for Q&A. So we have Lisa joining us. Um, we also have Eric joining us and you see he has already let you know to please put your questions in the chat. Um, and we will capture them in the notes that's also in the agenda document. Um, we posted that a couple of times in case you are looking for it. I'll post it one more time. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and hop right in. So I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. Just give me a second. Okay. All right, so again, as I shared, we are gonna provide you with some updates with the guidance document, but the majority of the time will be Q&A. Um, just as a reminder, we are recording these trainings, so we advise that you keep your camera off unless you absolutely wanna keep it on. Um, everyone is currently on mute. If you need any help, just let us know in the chat and we will do our best to support. And again, please put your questions in the chat. Alrighty, so these are all of the updates that have happened with the guidance document. Um, and I put it here in this way, just so you know that I'm not gonna walk you through every single one because not only did we put it here, um, but we also put it at the bottom of the agenda. And so just wanna give uh, Michelle and her team, she, Michelle isn't here today, but Michelle's team, they wrote this out for everyone. So you can you know, take a look at all of the things that have been changed and the locations of where those changes are. Um, if you need access to the guidance document, you have the link right here on the slide deck. You also have the link um, in the agenda. And so please take a look at all of the changes that have been made um, with Michelle's team and Lisa's team as well. They work really hard to make sure as information comes in, it is updated um, for all of you. So with that, I will end there with our guidance updates. Um, and Lisa, I'll pass it to you in case you have anything to add. And if not, we'll move into Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, I, I, I don't really have anything other than what Ruth already mentioned, which was all the um, guidance updates. Maybe I'll just mention one, one update in particular, just so people aren't confused. Uh, there was, I don't know if you remember at the end of the flipbook, a, a bunch of FAQs that we embedded within the flipbook. Um, and then we also had a separate local document that was about um, keeping kids in school and kind of quarantine questions. We basically just consolidated all of our local FAQs into one document. And you'll be able to find that document under the FAQ, the new FAQ section in the flipbook. So hopefully that's easier, you know, so that you don't have to look in two different places. Just know that all of our kind of frequently asked questions that, and we, we base those questions on what comes in, you know, what, like what we're getting from safe, the safe learning line and what we're hearing from all of you. Um, and we'll continue to update that document if there's things that the state is not, you know, isn't clear on or um, they're not able to answer, but we don't typically, we typically only develop FAQs if, it, if it's unclear at the state level. So that's all. And then, oh, and then I think uh, Dr. Locke is on the call too. So um, her and I will, um, we can, you know, tag team the questions as they come in. All right. So with that, we can get ready. There's Joanna. To... Hi, Joanna. Hi, Joanna. <laughs> and Joanna, morning, do you have anything? everyone. <laughs> do you, um, I forgot to mention, do you want to add anything or have any, provide any kind of updates before we get started on questions? Um, no, I mean, I guess the only thing to say is there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of um, movement around um, vaccine authorization over the next month. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, um, but I think boosters potentially, uh, you know, Pfizer's um, submitted data for older adults, Moderna's submitting data for everybody uh, for a fourth booster. And then Moderna is submitting uh, data for um, both school age and younger kids. So I think um, April may be a busy month for uh, vaccine authorization. So we will um, keep you posted as that moves forward. 
Thank you. And uh, Joanna has to leave, I think, at around 1030. So yeah. make sure you get your clinical questions <laughs> in the chat. <laughs> OK. Now, I am not seeing any questions in the chat yet. And Eric, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you are in charge with uh, moving them over to the agenda. Um, so I'll give it like about a minute or so to see if we can start generating some questions. And if not, then we may just need to do a, a quick pivot. Yep, and we no can also raise yet. hands to Ruth okay. if we want, right? Yeah. If just because we yeah. don't have a, yeah. Yep, absolutely. So if you'd so rather we, ask your question, please mm -hmm. ask your question. <laughs> All right. So we have our first question. Do you know if this program will be available for the 2022-2023 school year? And that's coming from uh, Jay Lovato. Jay, if you could come off mute, do you mean this COVID liaison, like check-in or, you know, COVID liaison program that we have? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Couldn't find yes. Any button. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. The programs that are within the schools right now, where the you know the tests come and we do the testing here oh. and so on and so forth. Um, you know, just trying to think ahead. Uh, will this program be available? Will the test still be avail available? If you even know the answer to that yet. Gotcha. So the state's testing task force, they actually sent out a survey to all of the participating schools a couple of weeks ago, and it was due, um, it's actually due at the end of the day today. So let me find that link. Um, and the purpose of that survey is to gauge how folks are using the testing program. They have not indicated as to whether or not, or to how long right. they'll keep right. the program going. Um, but I believe they are trying to plan ahead as well. Um, and so we've been encouraging all of our districts and schools that are using that program to please fill out that survey and make it known how that, um, how that testing program has been utilized um, within your district. Um, do you have anything to add, Dr. Locke or Lisa, from what you may be hearing about the testing program? No, I think CDPH is still, um sort of working on what planning is gonna look like next year. Um, but I haven't heard anything definite around what their testing support and other supports will look like. Lisa, do you have more details? Uh, same, uh, but I will say that on all of the state calls, this question comes up pretty much on every call. So they definitely know that, um, that, you know, that schools and districts are really looking for um, more clarity and so that they can start their planning around budget and just everything for next school year. So that they're hearing that and hopefully um, we'll get that information soon. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have some questions now starting to flow in. So this is from Kathy McCall. Um, shortened quarantine slash isolation allows a negative test on day five or later and then return to school day six with masking for an additional five days. Now with the masking change to strongly recommend recommended, does that mean that students may return day six or later without a mask? Dr. Lott or- I'm sorry, can you, um, maybe I can, I might need to list. Yeah, the question was asked at 10.07, if that helps you to find oh, it. Oh yeah, but, negative okay. test. Okay, so, um, so you'll remember that the, that the testing recommendations for isolation and quarantine have always been recommendations, not requirements, and that is still true. Um, and um, now that masking is um, a strong recommendation rather than uh, a mandate, um, the same holds true for the masking part of that guidance. So if someone, let's say, tests negative on day six, they want to return to school, um, we strongly recommend that they mask from day six to day 10. So it's not a mandate, it's a strong recommendation. And so sort of the way that we, the, the sort of the whole sentence is, we strongly recommend that everyone continue to mask, um, especially when you've been exposed, someone's been exposed or are returning early from isolation. So it's sort of extra important in those sort of two scenarios. Thank you, Dr. Locke. Okay, the next question comes from Rosalind Fleury. Do you know when private school spring break antigen test pickup will be? Um, so one of our staff members, uh, Nelson Alegria, 
he is in charge of that and he's actually been in touch with our private schools. And so I am putting his email in the chat right now. If you have not received, you or a leadership at your school has not received notification from him about that, please reach out to him immediately. My understanding is that they are going to start uh, distributing those tests within the next week or so. Um, so if you have not had any contact from him, again, please reach out to him directly and he can give you the information about how to make sure you're on that list um, or just giving you the information in general about picking up. Ruth, just uh, real quick, Roz, I also introduced you or CC'd um, Nelson on the email that you sent as well. So you can just uh, respond to that as well if you haven't heard back. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Okay, so next question is from Monica. Do we still need to require quarantine slash COVID testing for those who travel and are unvaccinated? So the recommendation is still to follow the CDC travel guidance, which I can um, drop into the chat. So there's sort of domestic and international um, recommendations and recommendations for vaccinated and unvaccinated. So yes, we still recommend that people follow the CDC guidance. Let me find it here. Thank you. All right, next question is from uh, Paul Ferris. Any update on the new COVID variant that is spreading? Um, yes, I can, so hold on. Sorry about that, Dr. No, Locke. Okay. Give me a moment to. <laughs> All right. Travel well, guidance we can, in the chat. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, we can do that if you're answering the questions, yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, so I mean, the BA2 variant is here. Um, you know, just because there's a new variant doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to make our case counts go up. Um, so far, our case counts are still falling. I think um, we were expecting them to sort of plateau and, you know, they, they are continuing to fall and the wastewater surveillance is supporting uh, the trend that we're seeing. Obviously, we know there's a lot of home testing. Um, so the absolute values that we um, get from the testing sites for the for the PCRs are going to underestimate cases, but we you know the wastewater trends look exactly the same as our case trends. So really, right now we are not seeing an impact from BA two. Obviously, we're keeping a close eye on it. You know we had a you know we have high vaccination rates here, um, and we had a lot of people that uh, were also infected with Omicron. So we have sort of you know at this point a, a fairly protected community. Um, so we're just watching carefully, but right now we're not seeing anything concerning. Okay, thank you, Dr. Locke. Um, and Anne o Okahara, I see that you had a similar question, which is pretty much thoughts on European surge and potential for coming surge here, thoughts on subvariant BA2. Not sure if you have anything else to add to that, uh, Dr. Locke. Yeah, I mean, the European surge, you know, it's tricky because, um, you know, they peeled off a lot of their, um, their recommendations and their mandates. So it's hard to know sort of what, what is causing the surge there. You know, is it related to, you know, vaccination and, and immunity coverage? How much is related to BA2? How much is related to, um, you know, masking and other requirements going away? It's sort of hard to untangle it. And it's not necessarily clear that, that we are going to see the same thing here. You know, we don't, we don't always see Show the me same a quote. thing that we do in Europe. Sorry, just gonna mute yeah. someone. Got it. Yeah, I already did it, Ruth. Okay, thank you. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the case that everything that happens in Europe happens here. Um, and, 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 and it's just hard to untangle sort of what's creating that that surge. So as I said, you know, we keep a close eye on case counts and wastewater. And um, so far, you know, we're not seeing a bump, which is great. Right, that's a great segue into the next question from Kathy Suazo. Can you explain the wastewater measurements and how they relate to COVID? Yeah, so in Alameda County, um, currently um, the wastewater measurements we get, it's not countywide, we have one site, it's East Bay Mud uh, Influent. We have one site in the county um, that um, gets measured on a regular basis that looks at the level of virus um, because you know people who are infected do shed um, virus in their stool. 
So we look at the virus and see whether or not the level of virus we're seeing in the wastewater tracks to our case counts. Um, and sometimes wastewater will bump before uh, the case counts do. So, so we, when they align, that's really good news. Um, and we um, have people within the department who are working on expanding our surveillance so that we can get a better sense of what's happening across the entire county. Some counties have multiple sites, some counties have nothing, and then some counties have you know, one or two. Um, so we're sort of thinking about how we can expand our surveillance going forward. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is from Carol Minns. Dr. Locke, do we have any data on whether or not people who had BA1 are more immune or less susceptible to BA2? I think the data is showing that they're less susceptible, um, but you know, there's always the time frame, right? So if someone was infected in you know, December 1st versus someone is infected now, because you know, immunity wanes, whether you're talking about uh, an actual infection or vaccination, um, you have a little bit of waning. So um, exactly what that will look like here for reinfection, you know, the reinfection rate uh, for Omicron was higher. You know, people that had had Delta were more likely to get infected in Omicron than we'd seen with other sort of uh, past variants. Um, it's not clear that the reinfection rate will look like that uh, for BA2 versus um, the original Omicron strain. So more to come. Thank you. Next question is from Catherine Negrosa. Um, if we don't test individuals who are still within their 90 days post COVID, what do we do when they have COVID symptoms? We have been requiring a rapid test when they feel better to return to school, but everything I read says that you do not need to test at all within 90 days post COVID. So the guidance for exposures um, is that if some, let's say you had COVID two months ago and you're exposed that you don't need to either quarantine or test. We still do recommend testing for symptoms though, but obviously not with a PCR test because those can stay positive um, for longer picking up old uh, virus. So using an antigen test is the right thing to do. Um, you know, the re you know, reinfection is not, common. I think the reinfection rate with Omicron was something like 4%, but it can happen, um, particularly as you get farther out towards the 90 days. So, you know, I think, um, I think using antigen testing is not unreasonable. And I think it's, it gets more important the closer you get to that 90 day mark, but definitely you don't want to use PCR and you don't need to test if it's just an exposure. Okay. The next question comes from Anna Martin. Have districts received the spring break at home test from the county? When should charters expect to be able to pick up kits from our charter authorizer? We've heard nothing and are authorized by OUSD. Let me do a quick check to see um, if all of the districts have picked up their, um, their kits. I know that we got them and got them ready to go. I just need to check to see if the pickup happened this week. Um, or if there is a plan to pick up next week. Um, but you are correct in that your authorizer, if you have an authorizer, you need to get your kids from them and all authorizers are aware of that. Um, so let me check on that and I'll put a response into the chat once I get it. Okay. I am not seeing any other questions. Eric, please let me know if I'm missing anything. We've, we've got all the ones covered that have come through. Okay, so why don't we do this? Because questions have been coming in pretty slowly, which says to me that maybe we don't have as many questions today. So why don't we give it a couple of minutes and you can either raise your hand if you have a question or drop it in the chat. Um, and we will respond. If nothing comes within the next couple of minutes, then we may be giving ourselves the gift of time on this lovely Friday morning. Excellent teacher wait time, Ruth. <laughs> And I am checking right now on the, um, the question about district pickup. All right, we have a question. Is there any updated information on the status of vaccination requirements for next year in the bills in the assembly? Um, Dr. Locke, I'll definitely let you hit on that. As far as the bills in the assembly, 
Um, it's still pretty early in the legislative process. Um, and so there are many things that can happen over the next couple of months around the bills that are in the assembly. Um, Dr. Locke, you mentioned earlier that there might be some changes coming around uh, vaccinations. I don't know if you wanted to repeat that or share any other information you might have. So the governor's mandate is still um, in play. So um, if the vaccines for 5 to 17 are fully approved by whatever the date is in July, I can never remember it's the 15th or the 30th, then, um, vac then the COVID vaccine will be mandated for next year. However, the personal belief exemption will stand. If the bill that's in the legislature passes, uh, the, there will be no personal belief exemption allowable. It will just be the medical exemption in the way that it is for the, all the other required um, school vaccines. So um, more to come on that. Okay. All right, got a couple more questions. Um, have tests for private schools been released yet? So we uh, talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so our staff member here, Nelson Alegria, he is the point person for privates. Um, and he has been in contact with private schools over, over the past couple of weeks. And so I just dropped his email into the chat. If you have not, you or your leadership, um, have not received any information from him, please reach out to him directly and he can let you know um, the status of picking up those tests. Okay, we have a question from Hannah. If someone is returning from isolation, what symptoms are acceptable to still have if their symptoms are still resolving? Um, so the one um, symptom that you can't return to school with is fever. So we say 24 hours fever free without use of fever reducers. For other things, we just say symptoms resolving. If you're if if a student is coming back from isolation early, so let's say they they had took a test on day seven and it's negative and they're coming back early, there's a strong recommendation for masking, as you know. Um, and so, you know, it's hard, there are certain symptoms where it's hard to wear a mask well. So if your nose is really running and you have a, still have a hacking cough. Um, so I think it's like, do you feel, does the student feel well enough to be in school? Um, and can they wear a mask for the, for however many days they have left until they reach their 10 day isolation? But the, you know, you really don't want to have someone in school with a fever. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Hannah Mestel. How is the mask mandate transition going across the county? Any lessons learned to share with districts? Things are going smoothly here. Just wondering if there are any stories to share, good or challenging. Um, so I think overall, the, what I've been hearing is just a push to normalize masking at all in all of the school spaces. Um, so that if folks continue to want to wear their mask and align with the, the recommendation to do so, um, that that just becomes a normal part of, you know, what happens in schools. So I haven't heard any um, particular stories around, you know, what's going well or what is challenging. Um, but what I do know is that uh, school leadership, as well as our communications team, they are uh, certainly working together to ensure that communication around masking um, is positive. Um, and that it, we are all creating an environment so that students and staff members and families um, can continue to wear masks should they choose to do so. Um, Lisa or Dr. Locke, are you hearing anything uh, directly through public health about how this is going? I have not heard anything. Um, Lisa, have you? I mean, just on our call, we had a leadership call this week. Um, from it seemed like most of the districts were saying that the students and even when they're you know the without the requirement of masks people were still wearing them that was like on Wednesday so that might change as the weeks go mm -hmm. on but that was I remember hearing that Dr. Locke on that call and there are certain districts that postponed I think OUSD and maybe was it Hayward, Hayward where yeah. they're requiring masks until after spring break um, I so San Lorenzo are, is and San Lorenzo though I think so. Yeah. 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 I think, I think it seemed like there was a little bit of surprise in terms of how many, um, sort of like what we see in the general public, how many people were still choosing to mask. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Anna Martin, is there anything released on how families can apply for the personal belief exemption at this time? 
Um, my understanding is that yeah. this is a, a process, yeah, that will be done district by district. Um, and so you would need to consult with your district when we get to that place um, to understand what is the process for making sure you have um, within your, your students' records that there is a personal belief exemption. And we're hoping the state releases guidance as well. Um, okay, scrolling down. Uh, okay, can you, this is from Anna Kennedy. Can you confirm what symptom list we should currently be using? Should we include stomach related symptoms and severe headache? I and this was a I'm, question asked at 1023. Yeah. Um, definitely, I'm putting the symptom, uh, the link to the CDC symptom list in the chat. Um, yes, both of those symptoms for sure. A lot of children will actually only have stomach symptoms. It's, it's one of the common symptoms in kids. So definitely um, you wanna test for stomach and definitely for headache as well. That's a common one. Okay. Um, and I got a, a message from Ann Okahara, and I just want to share my answer to everyone um, because it, it may apply. So whom should charters contact about the COVID test? Nelson is only for private schools. That is correct. Nelson is only for private schools. Charter schools should contact their authorizer. Um, and so if you are authorized by um, ACOE, then you can reach out to, you can either reach out to myself or you can reach out to Juwen Lamb. Um, who can support you with that. But again, you wanna reach out to your authorizer. All of the authorizers are receiving enough tests to pass out to their charters. And again, if you are an ACOE authorized school, you can reach out to myself and I'll connect you with Joanne. Or if you already have her information, you can reach out to her directly. Okay. Um, about the symptoms list, this is coming from Kylie Bennett. Can you describe what designates a severe headache? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty subjective, right? Um, I think um, you can ask the student how much it hurts. I mean, obviously, like if you can't, if it hurts too much to be in class, if it hurts too much to read, if you can't function, you know, versus just maybe the mild ache we get with, uh, you know, a little bit of allergy symptoms. But yeah, I mean, it's insert, there's certainly no sort of cut and dry definition of severe. It's sort of subjective from the patient's perspective. Okay. And Dr. Locke, you have to hop off in about one minute. So we're going to say last call for any clinical questions that um, only Dr. Locke can answer on this call today. Um, otherwise, you will have to reach out to our safe learning team and they can get back to you with a response. Um, let's see, we are hearing from doctors, this is from James, we are hearing from doctors that younger children who have COVID six months later are testing positive for type 1 diabetes. Comments? Yeah, there was a study that came out of that was published by the CDC maybe three or four weeks ago. It's not just kids. Um, having COVID does seem to increase um, your risk of being diagnosed um, with diabetes within the next year. I can't tell you what the change in risk is um, without going back and looking at the study, but I can do that and um, share with, uh, with Lisa and ACOE to send out. But it, 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 having COVID does appear to be a risk factor for developing type 1 diabetes. It's not, you know, 75% of the people that have COVID. It's, it's a small increase in risk, but the risk is definitely there. Okay, Dr. Locke, thank you so much um, for joining us. And thank you all. Dr. Locke. I will see you next time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I am not seeing any additional questions. So let's just say last call. And again, you can raise your hand or you can drop it in the chat since we are question light today. Okay, so seeing no additional questions, I think we can go ahead and call it. Um, if you have any questions after this, feel free to reach out to any of us, including the safe learning team um, or if you reach out to us here at ACOE, we will certainly connect you with the safe learning team. But 
Um, again, we appreciate you all showing up to these calls. Um, we will have this call again next month. Um, and so that third Friday of the month, so we are still scheduled to have that. Um, if something changes and we feel like we need to pivot, we will be sure to reach out to you. Um, but again, we are available if you need us. Any last words, Lisa? Nope, just have a great weekend, everybody. And thanks for all your hard work over the last two years. I guess this week was our two year shelter in place uh, anniversary, yeah. right? <laughs> Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, have a great weekend and hope you all are doing well. <laughs> Talk to you later. Take good care, everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you.